This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. We are honored today to have in our studio Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Governor, welcome to the show. Great to be back. Now, for all of our fans and listeners and viewers who are watching on YouTube or the TreyBlockerShow.com right now, wondering why I'm wearing this eye patch. I was wondering. I, I just want to make it clear that this is not a Congressman Dan Crenshaw impression. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, unlike Congressman Crenshaw, who is a decorated war hero, yes. uh, I had the misfortune of wrestling with a 90-pound golden retriever and getting called an eye. Was so, it your retriever? My golden retriever. Okay. Yeah. He's rough. He's vicious golden retriever. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Governor, we're about 25 days into a 140-day legislative session. A lot of big issues to talk about, which I definitely want to talk about. But first, I want to talk about you. Uh, you mm. were first on the show two years ago, right when hard I started. Hard to believe. It's hard, time, hard time flies. Yeah. And I think you were the second guest on the show, actually. So thank you for doing that sure. then. And we talked again during Hurricane Harvey about efforts to right. recover from that. And, and uh, so welcome back. And since then, we've added thousands of viewers and listeners. And so there are probably a lot of people listening who know Dan Patrick the name and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick the name, but don't know the person Dan Patrick. So I'm going to start off by asking you a very broad, open-ended question. All right. Who is Dan Patrick? I'm someone who uh, grew up on the streets of Baltimore uh, in the 50s. And uh, not that they were rough streets, uh, but I worked on rough streets. And so a little bit of a hard scrabble upbringing. Had great parents, uh, great family. That's when uh, uh, people and uncles and aunts and grandparents all lived on the same block or two streets over. So it was very family oriented. Uh, but I, I learned from my mom and dad who were... Uh, extremely hard workers, uh, both uh, uh, quit high school to jo join the war effort. My dad was in the Marines, mm -hmm. and my mom went and worked in the aircraft factory in uh, Baltimore. And, down, and uh, uh, so they were hard workers, part of that World War II generation, and uh, they taught me a lot of great lessons. My mom was really smart. My dad was really smart. He was a great leader. And although he nor she ever had a college education, um, they could have led a, a company. I right. uh, had those opportunities existed for them at the time. And so I had a great upbringing, a lot of love. Um, only child, no brothers, no sisters, so a lot of focus on me. Uh, That's a couple good. of cousins that we all kind of grew up in our w grandmother's w house. Would you consider yourself spoiled? Uh, I'm sure I was. Um, but, you know, uh, we didn't have a lot to be spoiled. We had right. a lot, you know. You know, when you're growing up, it's interesting. You don't know what you have and what you don't have. Sometimes you do. Right. You know, you see what another kid has, or you go to their house and wow. And uh, But I always had everything I needed. Uh, and then we moved out to the suburbs because my dad wanted to get me out of the inner city, where he grew up in mm -hmm. a, on a home that was built in 1904. And uh, I worked my way through college. I was the first kid in my family to go to college. And uh, But again, I just had a great family upbringing right. and a lot of love, and that's important. Um, so from there, uh, I wanted to be in radio and television. That was what I wanted to do. Uh, and, did, uh, did something inspire you in that regard? Uh, we took a tour one time uh, when I was in the ninth grade of, of radio and TV stations. I said, gosh, this is what I want to do. And right. so I worked my way through college as a disc jockey on a country western station outside of Baltimore. And then after that, I struggled to get a job because— Hold on uh, a second. Did you tell me there's a country and western station in Baltimore? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, you got to remember, okay. you got to remember, um, Maryland was a southern state. Um, mm. You know, neutral in the Civil War, but you know, Southern Maryland uh, and on the Eastern Shore, a lot of country listeners. But okay. uh, mm -hmm. it was it was uh, not the country we listen to today. You know, it was right. Kitty Wells and Ernest Tubb. It and was good country. It was good country, right. old country. And so uh, I did that, and I tried to get a job in radio and television. But I was when I was 22, I looked like I was maybe 15, <laughs> and uh, uh, so I couldn't get a job. And so I went to sales. I did that and was very good at that and traveled around the country. Uh, and eventually I landed a TV job. I never gave up. The one thing about Dan Patrick, uh, I don't give up. Right. Um, if I'm in it, I'm in it to win it. And eventually I got a job at a little TV station in Scranton doing the weather and sports. Did that for six months. I got the break of my life when a, uh, the news director from Washington, D.C. happened to catch my show when he was in the Pocono skiing on hmm. weekend, offered me a job. So I went to Washington, D.C. 
I didn't know at the time they were looking to revamp their anchor team with young people who they didn't have to pay a lot. And so uh, <laughs> I was the sports guy, and they hired Al Roker to be the weather guy. We started on the oh, same wow. day. I don't know whatever happened to Al. I think he's, I think he's doing okay. <laughs> I think so. Uh, he's making $25 million a year. I make $600 a month, so somewhere I went wrong. Uh, so I did that for a while, and then I came to Houston with KHOU-TV. I've always been involved and in, interested in things beyond what I was doing. So when I was doing sports, I would go and sit in with the news director in the news meetings. You know, they'd say, why are you sitting in here? You know, you're the sports guy. Cover Bob right. Phillips and the, you know, love you blue Houston Oilers. Right. But I always took an interest in that. And eventually I became a news anchor later on. But uh, I was always interested in doing charitable work and working in the community. And so public service is a part of what you do. When you're in television and radio, you really are in public service, particularly when you're working at the local level. Sure. And uh, you're going to a lot of events and helping a lot of causes. So I enjoyed that. And then I trans I transitioned into a, a business, and the economy uh, knocked out a lot of people in 1986, mm. including right. myself and my restaurant. So I had to start all over. I was in my 30s and had to start all over uh, with two young kids and uh, found this little radio station. And after the radio station... Uh, was on for about three months. A guy named Rush Limbaugh called, and uh, Rush said, uh, "I'm looking for a place to put on my radio show." Right. And back in the '80s, that was '88. No one, he couldn't find a station beyond. My station was like ranked 40th out of 40 in Houston. <laughs> we had more cows and listeners, and so I was at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, right. for him to call. Sure. And so I liked what I heard. I put him on. And uh, for the next 12 years, we had a great relationship. And we still have a great relationship, yeah. but, but he moved to another station when a company bought his show. But right. we've still been friends all these years. Right. I seem to recall you telling me a story a couple of years ago about you driving around downtown Houston trying to figure out exactly where the station yes. had the best signal. Yes. Tell, tell that story. So there was a station across town that I ended up buying two years later, ironically. But there was another station, um, and they wanted to take his show from us, which they could have done. Um, and so I called Rush on the weekend. I said, Rush, you know, I've invested all this money into the show. You've been with us from the beginning. We gave you your start. I need to, for you to stay with me. He said, well, you know, the other station says your signal's not very good. Well, our signal wasn't very good downtown <laughs> Houston. Great signal out and around, but, right. you know, concrete and tall buildings and steel will knock down an AM signal. So I, I uh, had an Econo Line Ford van at the time. It didn't have very good AM radio. So I rented a car that had good AM radio, and I drove – the streets of Houston, finding which streets the signal was really good on. Right. I picked Rush up at uh, Hobby Airport, and I said, let me just prove to you that we have a good signal. And we drove through all those good streets, and I said, see, no problem with the signal. <laughs> and uh, But he, he look, let me tell you something about Rush Limbaugh. He, he's the real deal, right. and he's very loyal, which is one of the things my mom and dad taught me to be loyal. Uh, you know, I run into people like Rick Perry later, very loyal. Mm -hmm. um, I run into President Trump, very loyal. And so loyalty is a lost virtue. Um, it's very important. You have to stick with people right. um, until there's a reason that they give you to move on. Sure. But uh, you stick with people even in their down times, besides when they're riding high. And so Rush said, oh, we'll stick with you. And so he stayed with me another decade. Oh, wow. And eventually uh, the company, uh, another company bought stations and, and bought his show and he moved on. But he still talks about me on the air occasionally whenever I get criticized by sure. someone in the national media. He said, no, I know Dan Patrick, you know, he's a good guy, and right. et cetera. So good friends. So, but you know, that's kind of my background. And, and then I was, and then I did talk radio for years, um, conservative talk radio. Everyone wanted to be the local rush, which mm. I, which we, you know, no one can beat rush, but I did my own style and I would have a lot of elected officials on a lot of, I did my show from the Capitol many times. Uh, and this would have been like from 2000 to 2006. And so I learned about the issues. And you really get close to the people. When you do three hours a day, five days a week, you can't fool the people. Right. You are who you are because they see through you. And so I'm conservative by nature. And, and uh, uh, there was an opening. John Lindsay retired from the Texas Senate in 2007, who was the senator in West Houston. And my kids were, my son was out of Baylor. My daughter was almost out of Baylor. Uh, and I thought, you know, it wasn't something that was on my bucket list to do. Sure. Um, the last time I ran for office was senior class president. Fortunately, we won that election, <laughs> you know, good. in high school. So you've got a perfect record. So I've had a perfect That's record great. so far. I, I, I need to know when to stop. You know, <laughs> don't want to have a, don't have a loss on the record. Right. But uh, so I ran, and and as you know, everyone thought Dan can't win. Right. I was in against two House chairmen and a city councilman. We got 70% of the vote, almost 70 for 69 and something, close to 70, in a four-way race, which I don't think has ever happened before, right. uh, against solid opponents who had good people with a lot of money, and we won that race, and we came in the Senate. So 
I kind of view myself, and I'll kind of wrap this part up, but I kind of view myself as people expect you to do what you say you were going to do. That's right. People expect you to stand up and fight for them. Um, and is it a little bit of, um, I'm a big movie fan, is it a little bit of seeing your heroes on the screen and saying that's what people expect? Right. They want, uh, and I'm by no means a hero at all, but they do want people to fight for them. And so once I feel like I have the high ground, and the high ground means in politics that you're on the side of the people mm -hmm. because they're the folks that have the high ground. Right. On an issue, and you know you're right, like in the Bible, in Nehemiah, they wanted Nehemiah to come down from the wall. And he said, no, I'm not coming down. I got a job to do. Right. And so um, I, I work well with others. As, we, as, as I said in my inauguration speech, we passed 1,592 bills last session. Only 23 passed with only Republican votes. So 99% of our bills had bipartisan support. Sure. Our budget passed out the first time, 31 to nothing. So obviously we can cobble together the left, the middle, and the right. But on an issues that I believe are right, uh, I'm going to stand where I think the people want me to stand. I think the biggest thing we have in politics today, too many people run for office, especially I see this on the national scene, and they really are not grounded on a solid foundation. They run and they say what they think people want to hear them say to get elected. That's and right. then they get elected, and then they're all over the map. And people right. say, well, wait a minute, that's not what you said. I actually ran on things that I believed in and still believe in. Sure. Um, and uh, that's liberty and that's freedom and the Second Amendment and pro-life and, and, and education, um, taking care of the poor and the, and the needy. Um, all of those issues and being a fiscal conservative because it's their money, not ours. So that's who I am. Just, you know, try to do what I, you know, I promised I would do. And if I do that, Trey, I can retire one day and look back and say, I didn't accomplish all the goals I set. Right. I didn't pass all the bills I wanted. But we were in every fight, and if we lost, someone else limped off the battlefield. Sure. And um, and actually, we've won most. We've won more than we've lost. Right. We've done some really good things. Absolutely. So when you first said to Jan, your wife, I think I want to run for the Texas Senate. Did she see it coming, or was it a complete surprise? I think it was a complete surprise. You know, I tell people, and I took it to God, and I took it to Jan. I had silence from both. <laughs> and um, look. If you go back through my life and my background, and all of us, particularly when you're living into your 60s, we all have a story to tell. That's or right. if you're in your 40s, you have a story to tell. And, and we get to where we are through very interesting paths sometimes, things that are not expected. But I can tell you as a Christian um, who made a full commitment to Christ later in life, um, in my 40s, there's, it's clear to me, I'm here by the grace of God, the hand of God. You know, how does a kid from you know, the marble step, 12 foot wide homes of East Baltimore end up as Lieutenant Governor of Texas, <laughs> who along the way, um, uh, you know, went broke, who along the way just had the struggles like everybody else has. Sure. Life is not a, you know, that, old country, that old country song that I used to spin. Um, you know, life's not a rose garden. Um, um, it's, it's not. You don't, you, don't, you don't go on a straight trajectory up from birth to death. Sure. You, you're, you're up and down. And uh, the Lord has picked me up every time I've been down, dusted me off, pointed me in the right direction. So, you know, I, I'm not shy about sharing my faith. I don't wear it on my sleeve, but, you know, I respect all religions, all, do, all denominations or religions. But um, I'm a Christian, and uh, whatever I have, I have because of uh, the grace of Jesus Christ in my life. That's right. So you now have, you have two wonderful children, yep. very successful children. Um, and five grandkids, five grandkids at this right. point? It's hard to believe. Four born since I became a lieutenant governor. Oh, wow. In the last four years. So, so what is the best part of, be, of being a grandpa? Um, when your little kids, and everyone a grandparent who's listening to this will know this, the best part is the first time when they recognize you by name. Mm. You know, there's that moment, about one and a half or two, somewhere in there. Right. Um, they recognize you. And the other best part is that um, all of us in life, you know, no matter what you do, you go back and say, gosh, if, if I could do this again, I could do it better. So we could all be better parents. When you're young, you have financial stress on you. You have career stress on you. You're trying to build your life. You know, you have two people working. And you know, my wife's always worked. She was a school teacher, and I worked. Um, and we had a great family. But today, I, you know, I'm, I make 
sure across all the T's and dot the I's with the grandkids. The, right. the toughest part of being in office is being away from home. Yeah. That's the toughest part. Sure. Because they grow up really fast when they're grandkids. You know, when they're your kids, you see them every day. But when you see your grandkids once a month or every two weeks, particularly in session, or even once a week, they grow really fast. Well, they're, they're all in the Houston area, right? Yep, so yep. at least that's useful yep, and yep. it makes that a little easier. Yeah. So let's talk about this legislative yep. session. We're in a new session. There's a new speaker, Dennis Bonin. Uh, there seems to be a lot of love going around, for lack of a better word. Everyone seems to be getting along. Uh, you know, the cynics around here don't think that's going to last. What do you think? Look, we'll have our disagreements, but we will. you can disagree without being disagreeable. And uh, not casting any aspersions on the past speaker, but this is a brand new day. Sure. Um, it, we are light years from where we were in past sessions. Um, Dennis, and I, I've I had two meetings with him today. Mm -hmm. um, I've had more meetings with Dennis by, I think, by double than I had in four years with the former speaker. And right. so I've never understood why it was House against the Senate, particularly when you were, were Republicans in leadership. That's right. And uh, so Dennis and I have made a commitment that we're going to work together in the best interest of the people. And that's not just the Republicans, but we represent every citizen, Democrats as well. And so we're going to work in the best interest of the people of Texas uh, and do our work and try to be unified on, on our message. I, I had wanted uh, to have the uh, press conference that we had before session four years ago and two years ago. I, I wanted the lieutenant governor, the speaker, and the governor to come out and say, this is where we're going, without specifics, because it's up right. to the members to write the bills. It's up to the members to decide the final message. Obviously, we have influence, but they need to know where you're going. You know, if you, if you expect people to follow you, a, a good leader sets the vision, sets the direction, Let's everyone know this is where we're going, but then they turn it over to people to get us there. Sure. And so that's what Dennis is doing. That's what I'm doing. We have a great relationship. We have a great relationship with the governor, and I've had a great relationship with him for four years. So I'm very optimistic. I believe at the end of the day um, this will be the most important session potentially in modern history because we're going to address property tax reform. We're going to address school finance. We're going to address teacher pay. We're going to address retired teacher issues. We're going to take on some of the hard stuff. And I, and I know going in that no matter what we do, it won't be enough for some people. That's right. There'll never be enough of whatever we do. But I know what we're attempting to do is so, so, so needed. People need, we need to slow down this growth of property taxes moving forward. People can't have their property taxes going up 7, 8, 9% a year. We want to put an end to that. So how do we do that, Governor? Um, well, that's, that is what... Um, the sessions for. Um, and so I don't want to steal the thunder of members, uh, what will be the specifics of the bill. But one of the things that you do, Trey, is right now cities and counties, and I know the mayors and county judges have a hard job, but so do we. And uh, we've never grown our budget here more than 4% in a year, or maybe a little bit more, but not much. Last year it went up 0.2% because we only have the sales tax money we bring in from the state. And so, but what's happened at the local level Local governments, and people may not know this, can grow their revenues by 8% without a vote of the people, plus new construction. Right. So you take an area like Travis County, they can grow their budgets by 8% every year without a vote of the people, plus new construction, which may be another 3 or 4%. And same way in Dallas and Houston are big areas. And people can't sustain that growth because if your budget grows by that much, then you, people's taxes are growing, business and homeowners. So we're going to slow that down. Um, the governor's laid out a bill of 2.5%. Right. Uh, we laid out a bill last session of 4%. So, and what that means to, to the people listening and watching is that if your government grows by more than population inflation or a little less than that, whatever the final number is, you automatically have a vote. Mm. So if they want to, if they want to grow their revenues by seven or eight or 9%, right. you're going to have to approve it at the local level. Okay. So if you, the rule of 72, whenever you divide into 72, you know, that's what it is. So if your property taxes go up 8% a year and nine years your taxes double, well, if we can cut that to where your property taxes go up 2 3 or 4% a year, now we're talking about your taxes don't double for 15 or 20 uh, and even longer. Right. So that's the key to do it. Um, so does that also address the appraisal creep? Uh, yes, that would address the appraisal creep. Right. Look, we want, here. here's the thing that, that, that uh, I don't think... Oh, a lot of elected officials understand. We want our appraisals to go up. Sure. If I buy a house right. for two hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> which is the average home in Texas, right? I want it to be worth more every year. So when I sell it, I make a profit. Good point. I just don't want to be taxed on it. 
right. as it goes up dollar for dollar. Sure. And so what happens is, think about this model. Let's say your listeners, let's divide your listeners in half. Half of the audience, we all buy a stock for 10 bucks. And half of the audience, it goes up to 30 tomorrow. Half the audience says, I want to sell. And the other half says, no, I want to hold on to it. Well, if the people who sell their stock, we shouldn't, those of us who hold it, we shouldn't pay a tax on their gain. Sure. And that's what happens in your neighborhood. You're living in your home. Your home has a certain value. Your neighbor sells because the dirt's worth more or the home's worth more, and they sell it. And the appraisal district comes in and says, well, now your house is worth that. Well, that's okay, but don't tax me on that. Right. So you have to have this kind of seesaw. So there are many ways to go about it, and reducing that, we call it the rollback rate, is one way to do it. And, and so that's, that's the plan. Where we end up exactly, we'll, we'll determine. A school finance is very difficult, um, uh, but we're going to address it. And, uh, and part of that is, for me, teachers, uh, I've already laid out a plan. Jane Nelson has filed a bill. Give every teacher in the state a $5,000 raise. I want to do it 10 over time, but five's a big step. Right. Because we have 350,000 teachers, that's $3.7 billion uh, almost, you know, because we're doing it for a two-year budget. That's real money. It's real money, and right. you have to sustain that going forward. But we gave every CPS worker a raise last year of $12,000. We didn't ask who were the best ones or, or the ones who barely made it. Sure. We just said we needed to improve the pay of those CPS workers. Well, we know there are great teachers. Most of them are great. A lot of good ones and some bad ones. I'll let the local school districts decide that. I just want to give every teacher a $5,000 raise, and then I want to put additional funding in, hundreds of millions of dollars to school districts to create their own incentive plan uh, designed to give teachers even more money. And we have to increase the rate of... Uh, teacher pay. Their insurance is going up. We have to look out for retired teachers, which we had. We put a billion dollars into retired teacher health care to try to limit the increase. But all of us are experienced higher, higher health care. Right. I don't care what business you're in. So we have to address that. So I'm focused. The most important person in a child's education is not an $80 million stadium. It's not a, a $50 million fancy facade school building. Right. It's not having the latest technology. All those things, the technology is important. The nice school building is important. The stadiums, I'm a big football fan, but you don't need an $80 million stadium. <laughs> right. But my point is all of that, the best curriculum, the best programs. If you don't have someone who's a great teacher, then it doesn't work. So next to the parent, the teacher is the most important part most important part of education. We spend $60 billion a year on education in Texas. Teachers' salaries are between 33 and 34 percent of that. Right. So, and we can't attract attract the best and the brightest no. to the field if we're not paying them well. No, you know what someone told me when I was education chair in 13. It was a great quite quite great answer to a question. Sometimes you, you think it's a hard question to solve, but someone has a simple answer. I said to this person who was testifying, "Why is it that we aren't attracting our best college students into teaching?" And the person said, "Well, Mr. Chairman." Uh, Back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, maybe into the early 90s, but particularly into the 80s, a woman who was in college had very few options for a career mm -hmm. in the corporate world. Right. She was either a teacher or she was a nurse. And so our best and brightest women uh, went into teaching or nursing right. because they just didn't have many opportunities. It was a man's world. Today, our best and brightest women say, wait a minute. I have, I have a lot of choices out there. Endless options. Endless options. Right. And do I want to teach for our average teacher who's making $52,000 a year in some areas they start at, you know, in their high 40s and get a $1,000 raise a year? And, and if they love teaching, the only way they can make more money is become a principal or a superintendent, but they want to be a teacher. So they're, they just have so many options. Right. So we have to make this an attractive option for men and women uh, teaching. And, and we have to keep the teachers we have. Look. Trey, we've added 10 million people since the year 2000. So we're up from 18 to 28 million today. We're going to add another 15 million people by the year 2040, 2045. We're going to need another 100,000 plus teachers. Or, That's right. And replace the, the, you know, the 150 or 200 that are going to retire in the next 15 years. Right. We have to make it an attractive profession. And so I'm all in this session for an across-the-board raise plus money for an incentive pay. Incentive pay. And... Uh, that's what I think is important. Okay. Well, I think that's all laudable, and, and I wish you all Godspeed in getting that accomplished. I know it's not yeah. an easy task. I want to ask you one other question, yeah. then we can wrap up. It's easy for the general public, especially if you're not in the coastal area, right. once a hurricane comes and goes, right. to kind of forget, up, forget about it, out of sight, out of mind. So where are we on Harvey recovery? What else needs to be done? Uh, first of all, 
the people of Texas have been amazing. Um, I've seen the worst of times and best of times in the last year and a half. The, the hurricane, the church shooting. We honored Steve Willersford on the Senate floor yesterday, who was the who was the gunman who went out of his house and took on the shooter. Right. And a, a, a true Texas and American hero. That's a hero. And then we had the school shooting. Um, I've seen the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, we are a we are a state where when we face hard times, we fall to our knees to pray, not because we give up. And so the people, the first responders, did an incredible job. Uh, we still have people that are rebuilding their homes. I talked to a few today. Right. But we've come a long, long way. Uh, John Corn and Ted Cruz have done a great job of getting us uh, billions of dollars for Hurricane Harvey relief. We're going to spend a lot of money out of the Rainy Day Fund this session okay. um, to fill in gaps. And uh, I think the governor has done a, a great job on this. Our senators who worked in those areas, uh, if I start naming them, I'll forget one, but all of them who worked in the coastal areas, you know, I was out there with them mucking out houses and, and working every day. So, but, and then we're going to have to look at a flood plan. Charles Perry has some ideas for that. Um, we probably need at least one dam in the greater Houston area. Sure. The coastal spine, the President Trump has talked about funding, which will help against a, a, a total major disaster, tsunami-type storm in right. the future. Uh, but we also have to look across the state of Texas. As Charles Perry says, we have earthen dams all over the state that flood and areas that flood. That's right. So uh, this is why I think it's going to be the, the greatest session um, that we've ever had. Uh, in modern times, because we're going to take on all these big issues. They're not going to be sexy. Right. Uh, it's going to be a lot of grunt work, you know, like the offensive line on the football team. You know, the star is the quarterback. No one knows who the offensive line is. But we're all going to be offensive linemen this session. Well, um, and it has a real effect on the real Texans. It has a so real effect. Important. And that's what Sam Houston said. The definition of a leader is um, to make the lives of people better or make the system they live under better. Right. And uh, because we're unified and there's harmony, um, uh, I think that we have a great chance to accomplish it. There will be disagreements, but at the end of the day, I'm so impressed with the speaker. Uh, Dennis is really doing a great job, and uh, we're working together. I've changed up my style. To, you know, I match, I match up my style, t- you know, to who I'm working with. Sure. And uh, we were uh, passing bills fast uh, and getting them out and sending them to the house and and because uh, that was our game plan. And this time, um, we've slowed down. I want to give Dennis a chance to get his feet on the ground. Right. He's so smart. He knows it backwards and forwards. I mean, he really knows what he's doing. Um, well, he's and, been in the legislature been, since he was, yeah. what, 23? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, so, so I'm, working, I'm working with a pro right. this time across the hall, and that makes all the difference in the world. Sure. Well, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, I appreciate you coming on the show once again. As you know, we like yeah. to end each show with some words of wisdom from our guests. Sometimes that's a quote from a famous person, a Bible verse, or just something that's on your mind. So what, what do you have for our listeners today? I'll give you two. One from the Bible, uh, which, which is on my coin, Matthew twenty twenty six. For those who wish to lead, you must first serve. You know, we're called public servants. If you want to be a leader, you have to serve first. Right. Jesus came as a servant, not as a king. Um, my own is, and I think I wrote this, but... Maybe I read it somewhere many years ago. <laughs> I'm not sure, so I don't want to be accused of plagiarizing. Yeah. Uh, I didn't come this far to only come this far. Mm, I like that. A lot of people get elected and they think that's the that's the victory. No. They reach the goal line. They reach the goal line. That's right. just the beginning. And so uh, I have significant influence and power as lieutenant governor of the 10th largest economy in the world, as does the speaker and the governor, and as does every member. Um I'm not going to sit on my rock and porch one day, you know, when I retire and look back and say, you know what? If I had a little bit more courage, if mm-hmm. I'd have been willing to take a little bit more heat, right. cast a tough vote, um, and even risk an election over something to do the right thing, I should have done it. That's right. Because God's given me that opportunity, and the people of Texas give me that opportunity. So I haven't only come this far to only come this far. Words of wisdom from Lieutenant uh, Governor Dan thank Patrick. Thanks Enjoyed for coming it. on the show. Yes, uh, thank thank you. you all for listening. Yeah. You can find us at TreyBlockerShow.com, YouTube, and your favorite podcast app. God bless.